going to go back and explain what you're doing. So I don't mind being interrupted. So if I'm saying something that you don't understand, um, go ahead and, and you know, put something in the Q&A and then Andrea, if you'll let me know um, if it's a question that, <clears throat> excuse me, has to do with this program. If it's just a general question, we'll take those afterwards. So if you wanna know something about something besides seed starting, we'll do that a little bit later. So, All right, uh, yeah, and the presentation usually lasts about an hour. We had that question already. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna back my computer up so I can put some notes in front of me here, um, but you won't see that anyway because uh, you should be seeing my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, I see it. Okay, I'm gonna make myself little over here in the corner too. Um, so we're going to be talking about indoor seed starting, um, and I'm really surprised at the number of people we have on here tonight. I think this may be one of the biggest audiences we've had in many, many months. Um, so I guess there's a lot of interest in starting your seed, your uh, plants from seed. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why would you want to do that, okay? Um, and probably the biggest thing is a greater selection of plants than you can get at garden centers. Um, you might have maybe a dozen tomato choices, for example, at a garden center and the usual bedding plants, you know, petunias and impatiens and marigolds and that sort of thing. But if you want some <clears throat> different plants or some perennials that aren't very expensive to get started, you can do that with seed starting. And I'll even tell you a way to do seed starting for perennials later that doesn't even involve getting the mess in your house. So um, by ordering seeds though from a seed catalog, you can really increase the kinds of plants you have access to. And, and you're able to fill many different niches depending on the size of the plant you want, its characteristics, its disease resistance, the length of the growing season and things. I have a catalog called Totally Tomatoes and I started counting the varieties it had. I stopped at 300 and there were still several more pages to go. Um, and it had nearly as many kinds of peppers to choose from. So depending on your particular garden site and the special needs you have uh, in your garden site, you can probably find a tomato or a pepper that fits it really well. Um, also, garden catalogs usually stand behind the quality of their seeds because their reputation is at stake. If you purchase seeds from a big box store, um, they really have little interest in the quality of the seed they have. They're just putting stuff out there because people will probably buy from them. It's more of a convenience. It's not their major income. And usually the packets you'll find there are also smaller too. They have less seeds in them. But you can also save a lot of money too by starting seeds from um, scratch or plants from scratch. Um, the price of one plant that you buy in a garden center will probably buy a packet of seeds that will grow anywhere from 15 to 1,000 plants. So um, most seeds can be kept from one year to the next two with a few exceptions. Um, and so you may buy a packet of seeds that will actually last you maybe two or four or five years. Um, and you can really save a lot of money that way. Another thing is a control of chemicals. Greenhouses <clears throat> may have used chemicals to control insects and diseases while the plants were growing. And um, some of them also use things like growth regulators. If a plant is growing too fast, and they don't want it to get too big too soon, or if they wanna try and make the plant grow a little faster because the date for their shipping is coming really close, um, they may use those kinds of chemicals. And by starting your own seeds, you're gonna avoid the use of all of those things. And then probably the last thing is people get kind of a great satisfaction, I know I do, um, from growing my plants from seeds because you can say, I took this little package of seeds and I grew it all the way to a plant in my garden and I got vegetables or fruit or whatever off of that plant. So in order to start seeds indoors, um, we usually um, start the seeds that need a long growing season. If you were to put tomatoes um, 
seeds in the ground. And by the way, I'm coming from central Wisconsin. So we live in zone four and um, it's going to snow probably about six inches tonight. And you know, like the high temperature for the day is 20 degrees. So if you're looking from someplace else, you know, you may have a long enough season to grow some of these things, but not where I live. And so tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, okra, um, celery, uh, many flowers take longer. If you want to get blooms the first year, you need to start them ahead of time. Um, some other ones are, are easier to start, um, like broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, um, those kinds of things. Um, and then you have a transplant to put out rather than starting from seed. Although you can buy some varieties that you can also start from seeds in the garden. Um, and uh, let's see, when to start seeds indoors. Okay, I'm doing this program in March. I have already started seeds for onions and impatiens um, because they need like 10 to 12 weeks before the last killing frost or before I would want to plant them outside. So you need to figure out what your last killing spring frost is. Um, and this is a map of Wisconsin. We're right in the corner of Wood County here. So May 17th to 23rd during that week sometime is usually the average last spring frost. But you have to remember that that's an average. So 50% of the time that last frost will be before that date and 50% of the time it will be after that date. So it could be as late as June 1st um, or sometimes even later into the first week in June. So um, your seed packet will say, um, to start it six to eight weeks before the last spring frost. So this will kind of give you an idea. If our last spring frost is May 12th, then you count back six to eight weeks from that date. And that is the week that you would want to start your seeds. <clears throat> um, there's a handout um, among the things that were uh, that link in the, the chat box. Um, and these are just examples of some things that if you say, if it's say to start at 12 to 13 weeks, that would probably be about mid-February for us. Um, and for example, those are mostly um, flower seeds. Um, you can see that I started my onions up here in about the middle part of February. They're just starting to come up. Um, and then when you get down further, about five to six weeks, this is when you would do like the tomatoes, about six to eight or nine weeks is peppers and okra, those kinds of things. Um, so it just gives you some idea, but there's also a handout and then look at your seed package too to tell you when to start. You don't wanna start them too soon because they'll get too big inside and they'll get floppy and they'll fall over and they'll maybe break off, but you also want that to start them soon enough that they get to be a good size before you are going, to, are going to want to put them out in the garden. So let's take a look at some of the supplies that you need. Um, you'll of course need seeds. You'll need some kind of containers to grow the flowers or the, the plants in. Um, usually a tray to put underneath those containers so that you keep uh, the surface dry wherever you're putting all of these containers of seeds. You need to some have some way of labeling the seeds or the plants or the container. Um, a seed starting mix, light and heat. Okay, the last one, heat, that's kind of an optional one, but it does work really well to get the seeds off to a good start. They germinate faster in a warmer climate. Um, other helpful planting supplies. Um, this is gonna be a little messy when you start. So you need to have a work area either that you don't mind getting a little bit dirty that you can clean up easily or else some maybe newspaper or plastic to protect the floor and the work surface that you're working on. You're going to need water either in a container or a source nearby like a faucet, um, a pencil or a dowel or some other tool for making indentations for plants, a spray water bottle, marker or pen to record what was planted, and then some kind of um, material that you can use to cover the seeds while they're germinating. And that could be plastic wrap, uh, plastic sheeting, a humidity dome, a pane of glass. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of anything you, you wanna use. It should generally be clear though, 
because um, that will allow the light to go through for those seeds that need light. And then as your plants grow, and access to a fan um, would also help because it helps to move the stems of the plants and the plants in response toughen up their stems. So when you put them outside, they aren't bent over by the wind. Um, the seeds that you wanna get, I would say order early, order as soon as you can. Um, I think the seed companies the last two years, we had so many people that got into gardening that they were kind of caught unawares um, and didn't have enough seeds. And you know that's still kind of true because we still have a lot of people who are doing gardening, kind of got started during COVID. Um, read the seed descriptions in the catalog to get the best plant for your needs. Check how many days it takes for it to mature. It's called days to maturity. Um, what size it's going to be. <clears throat> for example, you can get uh, tomatoes, um, small enough that you can put them in a pot on top of a patio table. Um, and you can also get ones that can grow uh, the length of like 10 feet vines. Um, so check to see all those things and carefully read the description. Um, it, is this a good um, plant? Sometimes they'll say for eating fresh or for canning or preserving. Um, most garden seeds don't need to be pre-treated. Occasionally you will find some flower seeds that need to be pre-treated. Pre Either they need to be chilled or they need to be soaked or something like that. So um, check your package for that and be ready to do that and have that done on the day that you wanna start planting the seeds. Um, when you get the seeds, keep them cool and dry. Um, many of them can be kept for several years if they're stored correctly. Um, one of the things you can do to um, store them from one year to another is to put them in a tightly sealed container, like a jar with a lid that screws on really tight and put them in a cool dry basement or in the corner of your refrigerator. Adding a desiccant will help keep them dry. Um, you can buy commercial ones, you know, like those little packs that come inside um, pill bottles and that sort of thing to keep the, the moisture uh, dry inside the bottle. But you can also do it um, at home by putting about two to four tablespoons of dry milk powder in a square of paper toweling and then tie that shut and stick it in the jar with the seeds. It acts as a desiccant to pick up the moisture that might be in the jar. Um, most seeds keep two to five years. The exception might be corn and onions. Onions get really low germination if you keep them from one year to the next and uh, some varieties of corn too. They just, not as many seeds sprout the next year. Um, seed packet information. This is an example of the back of a seed packet. And you can notice here, if you can see my cursor, it says this variety is a bush form of lake, blue lake pole beans. Um, and so this one's only gonna grow maybe two feet tall, the pole bean, uh, cousin of this one will probably grow to be eight or 10 feet tall. Um, this one won't need to be staked. Pole beans would have to be. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a description here. Six inch pods and they're going to have white seeds. They have to grow in full sun. It's going to take roughly 58 days from the time you put the seed in the ground until you start getting beans. Um, if you're going to put them in a container, <clears throat> it tells you how many that you should put in a container. Here's the planting depth, an inch, and you would need to thin them to six inches apart. So, um, and here it tells you the planting uh, schedule, sowing schedule for, and you can see in Wisconsin here, if you're kind of in the southeast half, um, it should be May to July. And if you're in the Northwest half, June and July. So, um, and it gives you a description here about some things that you can do when you are planting it. Um, and down on the bottom here, it will always tell you what, what year it was packed for. So this was packed for 2017. If that information isn't on your seed packet, you can just write on there, like if you bought seeds this year, just write 2022 on them and then you'll know how old they are in the future. Um, Donna, can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. So back on that one page, I think they're referring, 
my notification didn't pop up. So I just got this question now. And I'm assuming it's referring to that Wisconsin map you had. It just asked yeah. how current that map was and has it been adjusted for the climate change impact on the shortening winter? Yes, that's a current one. Um, and I got that one. I just looked it up when I was doing this program. And yes, they are adjusting them somewhat because of the global warming. Um, so in other words, the frost date would probably be moving back. Like if it was May 22nd, it might be May 21st or May 20th now. Um, and I've been finding the last couple of years that the springs don't warm up any faster, but the falls stay warmer longer. I mean, that's been my experience the last couple of years. But again, that's not an average of, you know, like 30 years worth. So, um, but yes, it is changing. Whoever asked that is right. It's true. Yep. Um, and then there is one other one for that. It just says my LED grow light has red lights and blue lights. Should I use red, blue, or both when starting the seeds indoors? Both of them. Okay. All right. Yep. That's all the questions I have now. Okay. Let's look at containers then. Um, you need to have it large enough for the plant. So probably... Um, if you're doing tomatoes, eventually you're going to want to have them in about a three inch pot. Otherwise they're gonna be really root bound. However, sometimes when you start flowers, you don't need near as big a pot because they don't get near as big before you put them out. Um, whatever they're made out of, they have to be sturdy enough to last the number of weeks that they'll be inside before you put them in the garden. An absolute must is drainage holes, no matter what kind of container you have. Either that or the container itself has to be really porous. Um, you may start small and transplant, or you can start with a bigger container, and then you might not have to transplant at some time before you put them outside. The container must be clean and sterile if you're reusing it. So if you have containers that you bought plants in a previous year, they should be scrubbed clean with soap and water, rinsed, and then soaked in a 10% bleach solution and allowed to rinse and allowed to dry again before you um, use them. If you don't do that, you may be introducing um, disease organisms that are gonna affect the seedlings once they sprout. And then you need a tray or some kind of um, container underneath all these, these little pots to protect the surface that the, the um, uh, containers are sitting on. And these are examples, these pictures are examples of the kind of ready-made things you can buy in stores. These are like the Jiffy pots. Um, the middle one here is called a soil block and it's made with this tool on the bottom here. You pack the soil into that and then you place it down on, on a surface or a container and you pull up on that bar across right here and that deposits the blocks on your um, in your container. Um, this is a little pricey but it eliminates all the containers you might have to buy or replace or clean up or whatever year after year. Um, they also come with what are called dibbles in them and you can see that the seed was started here in a very very tiny little square and now it can be set into this bigger square to grow until it's put out in the garden. Um, garden supply companies do have these. And like I say, they're a little pricey to begin with. I kind of like them because um, I can put quite a few pots or quite a few plants started in a very small space. Um, they also claim that the divisions here help to kind of air prune the roots so that they don't grow from one container into the other. Uh, other than that, we have the typical um, plant starting container here where you have rows of cells um, and they come again in different sizes from maybe an inch squared all the way up to three inches square. Um, in the bottom here, we have <clears throat> what's called peat pots um, and they're made of a, a peat material or a biodegradable material. The advantage of this one is when you put the pot in the ground, if you're 
make sure that none of the pot is above the soil level. Um, in other words, plant it deep enough, you can plant the whole pot. You don't have to worry about taking it out of the pot and putting it in the ground and you know, disturbing the roots or anything like that. This container over here um, in the lower left is a, a growing system that a few companies have. Um, I tried one of these one year. It usually consists of some kind of um, little cells here on the top layer and then a water source on the bottom. Um, I found that these were really hard to clean. Um, <clears throat> the company that I used put us what they call a sponge. You could just drop this thing into those holes, but the sponge wasn't biodegradable. And so I had all these sponges coming up and hanging around in my garden year after year. But I still have the um, plastic dome and the very bottom of this, which is what I use to put my soil blocks in. So, um, but, and these are all things that you can buy, you know, if you go into, you know, like a, a garden center or a big box store, you can see the, uh, you know, hundreds of different kinds of things they want to sell you for seed starting. However, you don't have to have any of that if you don't want to. <clears throat> the, um, the top left here, these are paper pots. Um, and you can actually get a tool to help you make them. You wrap the paper around it and then stamp it down and fold the bottom in. Um, and in this case, then you don't need to puncture holes because the paper is porous too. The water will soak through it and down into your tray. Um, some people have used like egg cartons or egg shells to start plants. You're definitely going to need to transplant these because they're uh, much too small for a plant to grow to to full size. You can also start seeds in things like um, takeout containers, um, you know, really any container that you have um, might work as long as it's got holes in the bottom and some way to put a cover over it when the seeds are germinating. Um, this is a kind of a seed starting tray um, where it's actually a, a big flat piece and then you just make rows in it and plant your seeds into those rows. And you can see that they've got markers in there um, indicating what kind of plant it is. It looks like it might all be maybe cucumbers or maybe um, looks like maybe pumpkin seeds or squash seeds. But anyway, you want to know which variety is which when you um, are putting them out in the garden. And then over here is another example of a, you know, reuse a container, punch some holes in the bottom of a yogurt cup which is just about the right size for most plants um, before you, to grow to that size before you put them out in the garden. So that's another use. And then, you know, you can um, rinse them out a little bit and recycle them after that. So um, there's any number of things you can use. Um, other people have used um, paper towel tubes or uh, toilet paper tubes, uh, the inside of the core. Um, plastic or foam cups, as, as long as you have holes in the bottom of the plastic or styrofoam cups. Um, I just kind of like that soil block maker I've showed you um, and then planting into peat pots because it's not any plastic waste then that goes into a land, into a, you know, the garbage in the landfill. But it's up to you, you know. And use whatever, when you're getting started, use whatever that you have um, if you're trying to save a little money. Um, and, you know, just try out some things and see work, what works best for you um, when you're doing it. Donna, we had a question about mm -hmm. using peat pots that they had trouble with them getting moldy, even with a fan blowing on them. Is there any suggestions? Probably they're watering them too much. The peat pot can actually look kind of dry on the outside before you water it again. Yeah, if you're getting mold on the pots or the top of the soil, there's too much water. Okay, plant labels. Um, you can buy all kinds of labels too. Um, popsicle sticks are a good choice, old blind slats. Um, this is like a cottage cheese or a yogurt container that's been cut into strips and then you can write on that with a permanent marker. Um, you can also uh, mark the pot itself with a waterproof marker, depending on the, what you're using for a pot. Um, you can put tape 
and then on a pot and you know write that on the name on it with a marker so anything that works for you kind of depending on the the what your pot or your container is made out of and then what can you use to mark that um seed starting mix this is another important thing that to take note of because you're not using potting soil. You need to get seed starting mix and it's a mixture of perlite, vermiculite and either milled peat moss or coconut core. Um, milled peat moss, that peat moss is kind of a non-renewable resource. Coconut core is like what they have left over from processing coconut. So it's plentiful. Um, often it comes in a compacted block that you put in a bucket of water and let it soak. And as it soaks up the water, it breaks apart. You can mix your own soil if you want to. And it's like one third perlite, one third vermiculite, and then one third either coconut core or peat moss. Um, but if you don't want to get into that, you can buy seed starting mix, which is basically those three parts. Um, you want the seed starting mix to be light and airy, which is why you have the perlite and the vermiculite, but you also want it to be able to hold water, which is why you have the peat moss or coconut core. It should have little or no fertilizer in it and no water holding crystals. Um, and that's another reason why you don't want to use potting soil because usually potting soil has those two things added to it. Don't use garden soil. Um, that's got all the little microorganisms from out in your garden and a lot of those are not good for little plants when they're starting out. Um, a seed starting mix or potting soil, um, if you transfer later, um, it should be free of weed seeds. Um, it's less likely to transfer diseases. And as I said, you can make your own or um, buy it ready made. Okay, a light source. Um, window light is usually not strong enough to prevent the, the plant from getting leggy, it means it gets tall and skinny. Um, and it's often too cold near a window too for um, a plant to um, really grow well. And so artificial light of some kind is needed and it can be either fluorescent or LED. Um, incandescent bulbs are too warm. You have to keep them pretty close to the plant and they will actually kind of fry your plant. Um, they should contain full spectrum, which is often another name for grow lights. Or if you're using just a plain old shop light fixture, one warm bulb and one cool bulb, and you can adjust them as plants grow, but that you need to be able to either move your plants down under, from under the light or move the light up as the plants grow. Um, some people have like uh, put the light under a table and um, suspended it with like cord or string or a chain. And then, you know, you can move the light up as the plants grow. Um, I know people who have put them on the floor in the basement and, it's, and hung the shop light or whatever from the ceiling on a long string or rope, but they, it has to be adjustable because your plants will grow. Um, heat source is not really required, but it does make the germination go faster. If you don't have that, um, find a place in your house where it's, it's a little bit warmer than the regular air temperature. It could be at the top of a refrigerator. Maybe you have some shelves over a heat register near a furnace in the basement. Um, it shouldn't be close to like doors or anything where you're opening and getting a draft. Should be away from windows. Um, do not use a people heating mat or heating pad for this because they're not waterproof. Um, and the heating pad you see here is the most common kind for home gardeners and it's all sealed in plastic. Um, so that even if you spill water on it, it's not going to like short out or anything. And it's called a seedling heat mat. Um, I found I start my plants in the basement and I have some shelves near the furnace and I did a little experiment. I have um, the temperature on the top shelf of those shelves is actually about seven or eight degrees warmer than if I had set the plants uh, to start on the floor in the basement. So sometimes just a little bit of 
um, raising it up either on shelves or finding a higher place somewhere because heat rises. And so it's going to be warmer there if you don't have the heat mat. And the seeds will sprout. It'll just maybe take them a few days longer than if you have the heating mat. So that, I mean, that's not a, a must have in order to start seeds. We have a few questions, Donna, if I could interrupt. Sure. Quick. sure. The first one was about the lights yet. Do the mm -hmm. lights need to be close to the plants and how far away do you recommend? Yeah, we're going to get to that. All right. Um, the next ones are about the heating ones. So why should the heat mat be away from windows? The, there's a draft off the window. Put your hand by a window or underneath the window ledge of the window. You can feel the cold air coming off of it. And you All right. And then another question is, yep. can you put different crops on the same heat mat? Yeah, sure. Sure. You could have a container and you could have five tomatoes and six peppers and some other, you know, flowers or something and maybe a couple of broccoli plants. Put it all in the same heat mat. All right, that was it for now. So, and we'll get to the light question soon. Okay, yeah, they probably won't all sprout at the same time because they have different days to germination, but you can still put them all on the same heat mat. You don't have to do them one after the other. Um, okay, now the actual how-to. Um, choose an area that can get dirty, we said, or, the, or otherwise put down some kind of protection. Grab a bucket of water if you aren't near the water source because you will need quite a bit. It takes quite a bit to um, moisten the, the uh, seed starting soil. Um, I use an old dish pan. You could use a clean pail. Um, again, you want to keep whatever you're mixing that in to moisten it, that has to be as clean as all the other stuff you're using. So don't take some dirty old pail and bring it in from outside and mix your stuff in it. Um, you hit add water to the mix until it holds together when you squeeze it, but not so much water that it drips out when you squeeze it. So just nice and moist that when you squeeze it, it, it stays in a ball or a, a squeezed handful. Um, fill your containers. Um, to near the top and pat it down gently. You want to make sure that you don't have any air pockets underneath, um, but don't really like pat it down real hard either because you have to have um, air spaces in there for the roots to breathe when they grow. Um, if you're seeding it, um, you can either use a large undivided container and make rows I wouldn't suggest doing this for different varieties though. Like somebody talked about putting the same um, things on a heat mat. If you're starting, for example, um, celery seeds and pepper seeds, the pepper seeds are gonna be up and going and you don't have to dig those out and disturb the other seeds while they're germinating. So only one kind in a container if you're starting a bunch in one container. Um, and usually you make rows, you know, you can um, press a uh, pencil lightly on the top to make a, a row or um, use a, the tip of a knife or something to, you know, squiggle a row and where you're going to plant your seeds. Um, if you're using individual containers, a pencil just to poke a hole to the planting depth. I often use, um, for really tiny seeds, I use a tweezers to put the seeds and then I can push them down into the soil as deep as they're supposed to be. So if they're supposed to be a quarter of an inch, I push them down about a quarter of an inch and then let go with the tweezers and then just smooth the soil over the top. Um, if you're planting individual containers, you can put one to two seeds in a container. Um, if you get two plants growing, you can always cut off one. Um, if you're doing a bigger container, say a takeout food container, and you make two rows in there, you can plant the seeds um, maybe half an inch to an inch apart, um, enough so that you'll be able to separate them later to put them in separate pots. Um, some seeds should not be covered. It'll say it needs light to germinate, so then don't put any more mix on top of the seeds. Um, if they need to be covered, you can sprinkle some vermiculite or, or planting uh, mix over the seeds. Um, 
and then push it down a little bit because you want to make the seeds to make good contact with the soil and then mist the surface of that um, container until it's thoroughly wet. Be careful when you're misting though, if you don't cover the seeds that you don't wash them all away or make them all you know, pile up in one area. Um, and then make sure that you're labeling as you're planting so that you um, aren't confused about later, like, okay, now what is this coming up here? And I've got three kinds of peppers, which one is this? Um, so make sure that you do that labeling as you're sowing the seeds. We talked about a little bit about saving seeds earlier. Um, I don't think I'll repeat that um, if anybody has. Oh, but don't throw away the seed packet. If you use all the seeds, don't throw it away because there's other information on there, um, like how far apart to thin them later when you put it in the garden maybe, or how far apart to place the plants in the garden. So um, don't throw that package away, even if it's empty. Um, and sometimes I use that package to write on some comments so that if I go to order seeds the next year, I know whether or not I want to order that seed again. Did it, did it do good or didn't it do so good? Um, and then until the seeds germinate, you need to keep them covered to prevent them from drying out. Um, you may, if the cover is not pretty sealed, you may have to mist it a little bit to keep that top surface moist. You don't want it like soggy, but you do want it to be um, that you can see that it's damp. Um, put them in a warm place or on a heat mat and keep it in a lighted area if light is needed for germination. And then um, depending on your seed pack, it might say it'll take seven to 10 days for germination. Um, once that minimum days are up, you need to check every day to see if the seeds are sprouting or not. The germination time will depend on the temperature and the kind of plant that you are um, growing. So um, if you're not sure how many days it takes to germinate, after maybe three or four days, I'd start checking. Um, so, it, and sometimes, like I say, if, it, if you don't use a heat mat, um, it may take a couple of days longer. Um, if you have a heat mat, you may actually see them come up a, a day or two sooner. Um, germination problems. Okay, what if you're not getting anything to come up? Okay, um, a couple of reasons might be if you have old seeds or improperly stored seeds um, that you're reusing from another year. Um, the temperature might be too cool. In that case, you might just have to wait a few more days. If for some reason it got really, really warm, you might have cooked your seeds. Um, too much water or too little water, probably more on the order of too little water if the, the soil in that top layer where the seed was dried out, that little seedling might have died even though it started to sprout because it didn't have enough water. Um, the most common one I see is that seeds are not planted at the right depth. They're either too deep or too shallow. And um, the seed has to kind of be in that sweet spot um, to, to really germinate well. And that could be anywhere from laying on top the surface all the way to being planted like an inch or two deep. So, um, and probably too deep is more often a cause for lack of germination. The little seed just doesn't have enough energy to get all the way up to the surface to get at the light. Um, not enough light, um, especially if the seeds need light to germinate. And occasionally, if you were supposed to pre-treat the seeds in some way, if they should have been soaked or, or something like that, um, it may take a lot longer to germinate or it just might not germinate at all. So- um, Donna, are... we have a few questions too about sure. this. All right, sure. so back to when the seedlings start. So is it true that once seedlings have sprouted two leaves, they can be removed from the heat mat and keep under lights only? Yep, I'm just going to get to that. Okay. Um, and then we need a couple other ones. We have, do you have an example of something that needs just light to germinate? Uh, not as far as I know. You almost have, you have to have it on some kind of soil. I wonder if they were re like referring to heat and light. Heat and light. 
Um, sure, like um, some of the very fine flower seeds um, that I've planted. Um, so I've had some lettuce seeds that said don't cover it. So in that case, yeah, I mean, they're out in the garden and, you know, the weather can be kind of cool when you plant lettuce seeds and, you know, all they need is the light and the, the moist soil that they're sitting on to germinate. Sure. And then there is one other one where, or a couple other ones. Um, how long would you wait until you give up on a germination of seeds? Probably at least double the germination time. Um, if you're, if you want to see if you can see whether they're germinating and, you know, sometimes seeds will rot if they're, if the soil is really, really wet, but that usually happens more outside than inside. Um, but you can scratch the soil where you put the seed in and see if you can see anything of the seed down there. Is it still there and it just didn't do anything? Um, is it kind of like, mushy and you know soft and stuff and it maybe has a little root sticking up but that's all um it it might still germinate if it's really mushy then it's probably rotted um you, you can do a little bit of you know poking around and seeing if you can find anything and when it gets to be maybe a week or two past the germination i've had some plants though where germination is like 21 days or 28 days. So see if you can find out what the germination, days to germination should be um, if it's not on the seed package. A lot of times if you Google that, you can find something like that. Um, and there was another one too that says, I've heard that you're supposed to remove the heat mat and humidity dome once seedlings appear. Should I do this once I see one seedling? or once they have all germinated? The questions are coming just as I'm getting to them. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to wait, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my next sentence is going to be, as soon as the seeds begin to sprout, when about 50% of them have sprouted, you need to remove that uh, humidity cover or the plastic wrap or whatever you have around it and remove it from the heat source. The rest will probably slowly sprout after that. Um, and at that point, they all need to be put in a bright light for 12 to 16 hours a day. You don't want the light on 24 hours. They need to rest too, just like we need to rest. And, that, and then you wanna leave them at room temperature or maybe even slightly cooler. So, you know, basements, if you have a furnace in your basement, um, so it's not like 52, like underground temperature, you know, if it's in the maybe around 60, that's fine. Um, or room temperature, if you leave it um, upstairs in your house. Um, and then you need to start, um, walk, oh, I got to make my screen go to the next one. Um, monitor the watering. Um, the very, very top surface can be almost a little bit dry, but may, you know, kind of check that underneath it's still um, damp. Um, bottom water if possible, but you don't want the pots ever sitting in water, just like you do with your house plants. You don't want to have a plant sitting in that saucer of water. Um, bottom watering works really well because that keeps the top of the soil from getting um, moss growing on it. And it also keeps the moisture off the little seedling because if you have too much there, they get what's called damping off and the seed just kind of the stem like collapses and that's due to a microorganism too. So um, when, and then when you, the plants have one to two sets of true leaves, you can thin them out. If you have too many growing in a pot, like you put in two seeds and you, you only want one in the pot, um, cut one off. Don't pull it out, cut it off because if you pull it out, you could also pull out or disturb the roots of the plant you want to leave there. Um, and when we talk about true leaves, the first leaves that come up um, from the seed are called cotyledons and they are not true leaves. And if you look at them closely, they usually don't look anything like the leaves that should be on that kind of plant. Um, the true leaves will come beyond that. And usually it's a pair um, that grows out of that. So 
at the point that they're transplanted, you will actually have four to six leaves, quote, but two of them will be um, not true leaves. They're called cotyledons. And those are actually um, little tiny structures that were in the seed. Um, and they're the first ones to come up to start getting that light and making energy for the plant. Um, let's see, where are we going from here? Okay, transplanting. Um, if you started your plants in really small things, like you used egg cartons or something like that, um, or if they were planted in rows in a, in a container, you will have to transplant them into a, a bigger container or pot. Um, you can use a dull knife or a popsicle stick um, to kind of tease apart the roots and support that root ball with either a spoon or the popsicle stick or the knife um, thing. So when you pick up the plant, by the way, pick it up by the leaves, not the stem. If you break off the leaf, the plant will replace it. If you break the stem, it's a goner. So um, kind of hold it under the bottom, kind of like you'd hold a baby by the by the the, the back and the butt, only you're doing the leaves and the roots and um, place it then in a separate pot that's been filled with moistened soil, um, more seed, seed starting mix, and then add enough mix to fill the pot and kind of gently pat it down to support the stem of the plant. At that point, you water it well. And if the mix settles down, add a little bit more if it settles too much. Um, you want to leave just a, a tiny bit of rim on the container or the pot so that when you water it, if you're watering from the top, it doesn't just run all over. Um, growing on, um, bottom watering is best if you can manage it, if you have the containers in a tray of some kind. Um, sometimes you can get, uh, and you may have gotten these from, if you went to a greenhouse, it's it's like a, a screen basket or a kind of a crate thing. Um, and you set the pots in there and then um, you put them on the tray inside this mesh um, thing. And then when you water it, if you have extra water, you can lift that out, dump out the tray and then put the plants back in there. Um, also, if you just, if you just, pour the water in the tray where the plants are sitting uh, gradually um, and then watch what is soaked up from the plants um, and stop when, they're, when their pots look uh, damp, okay, up the side or, or on the top. But you don't wanna keep them sitting in the, so in the water, just like you don't wanna do that with house plants. Um, we had a quick question about the transplanting. Is regular potting soil okay to use when you transplant then? Uh, I would still kind of stick to that seed starting mix because your plants are pretty small and they're still in danger yet of damping off, we call it. Um, so I would still use that seed starting mix. If you put them outside in a container, when you plant them outside, then you can use potting mix. Then you wanna keep the light source um, one to three inches above the tops of the plant and you either have to raise the light or lower the plant. And you need to check every day because those little plants, when once they get going, they can grow like an inch a day um, sometimes and sometimes even more depending on the kind of plant. Um, some of them grow faster. Tomatoes in particular you know, can grow quite a bit in one day. Um, when they have several sets of true leaves, you can start adding a little bit of fertilizer to the water when you water once or twice a week, only like a quarter strength. So if, it's, if your container says it's supposed to have a, a teaspoon of um, fertilizer per quart or whatever, use a quarter teaspoon. Um, and then beware of adding too much fertilizer though. I sometimes wait until I actually see the green being a little bit not so green. Um, and that's a sign that the plant needs more nitrogen or fertilizer. If you put too much fertilizer in, you're gonna get a lot of leaves 
and big plant growth, but you're not going to get flowers or vegetables. Um, you, it's just going to make lots of leaves and it's going to grow too fast probably before you get it um, warm enough outside to put it out. So be careful of how much fertilizer to use um, and kind of watch the plant. Um, if you have a fan, set it near the plants to provide air circulation. Another thing you can do um, to strengthen the plant stems is just to go down there and sort of like pet the plants, you know, run your hands through the leaves at the top of the plants gently. Um, that's going to stimulate the, the stems to grow stronger because you're moving them around and the plant says, oh, I got to get stronger here so I don't get knocked over. So that's another thing you can do if you don't have the fan or, or um, don't want to use the fan. But the um, fan does help too with damping off. And that's what we're going to talk about next is some of the problems. Um, if a plant stem just suddenly collapses, like one day it looks fine and the next day you go down and you look at them and the plant is just like folded in half. Um, that's called damping off and it's caused by too much moisture or humidity um, or watering the plant from above rather than underneath poor air circulation, poor drainage, there might be water sitting in the pots um, or under the pots and um, using a, a potting mix instead of a seed growing mix because the organism that causes that is a small organism that's in the soil outside, you know, and a lot of, a lot of times. And it could also be just dirty containers if it was used before and it had garden soil in it or even potting mix or the plant um, was exposed to that before it got planted out in the garden when it was in that original container. Um, all those things can contribute to that. That's why it's really important to keep everything really clean that you're using. Um, if the, the container wasn't sterilized, for example, um, and you're reusing it from another year. Um, yellowing leaves. Um, most often it's two things, um, either it's running out of nutrients and you need to add a little bit of um, uh, fertilizer to the watering um, and overcrowding of seedlings, which means they're, they're fighting over the nutrients so they're not getting enough. So you might wanna thin seedlings if that's the problem. And the other big one is too much water because if we soak the, the roots and they get waterlogged, they'll die. And then the plant cannot bring up the nutrients it needs. Even if it's in the soil, it just can't get it. Um, also applying too much fertilizer um, can ca cause the same thing. It, it burns the roots and then the leaves are yellow because it's not being able to get the nutrients. Insufficient light or the heat source or the light source is too far from your seedlings might also be another cause or too high of temperatures, but most likely it's either not getting enough nutrients or too much watering. If you water too much, there isn't too much you can do about that because the plant probably is not going to survive. But if it's a nutrient deficiency, a little fertilizer does wonders. Um, another thing, if the leaf edges curl under or they're stunted or slow growth, um, that might be because they're getting too much light. Like I said, they need about um, probably eight to 12 hours of dark, or you can look at it 12 to 16 hours of light. Um, so it's if you have a timer, that's a good thing to put on your lights and you don't have to remember to go and turn them off and on every morning and every night. Um, for over or under fertilizing might cause that too. Uh, too low of a temperature, um, don't overwater. Um, moss or mold growing on the surface. Somebody asked about this earlier about uh, the mold on, on the pots. Um, lack of air circulation, um, too much moisture, you're watering too much. Um, the soil is remaining really wet for a long time. Um, those might be some of the things. Um, make sure again that you feel to see whether they need to be watered before you actually go on just water them. Um, it should be moist but not soaking wet. Um, tall spindly plants, generally this is not enough light or they're too far from the light source. You may have a light on them but the light is like 
five or six or seven inches away. Also, um, if they're too crowded, you have the plants in small pots and they're just getting too big for those pots. So they're jammed too close together. So they're, they're just saying, I got to get taller than my neighbor so I can get the light and he can't get it. And so um, that's you know probably the problem if they're getting too tall and spindly. Um, now that you got them all growing, hopefully, and we got them all through that damping off stage and they're nice little transplants, um, they need to be hardened off before you plant them outside. Um, they've been growing inside and they've been pampered, they've been watered a lot, they've gotten lots of light, they haven't been exposed to any wind or storms or anything. And once you put them outside, it's not going to be like that anymore. So we have to toughen them up. And that's what's called hardening off. Um, while they're indoors yet, you can gradually increase the intervals between watering. So, you know, letting the soil get a little, not, not dry, dry, but letting it get um, not so constantly moist. So they kind of get the use to the fact that, okay, it's going to get water and then it's going to get a little drier and then, then we're going to get some water again. Um, and then starting about two weeks before when you want to put them outside, you have to put them out, start getting them used to the outside. Um, so you want to start on a pretty warm day and you want to place the plants in the shade and out of the wind for a couple hours. Um, if you have to put them out in the light, then start with just an hour or two um, and bring them in at night. Um, and then each day expose them to more time outside and gradually increase the amount of sun they get and the amount of wind they're exposed to over a period of, of, of about two weeks. And once they're, um, I would say after you've gone maybe a week and a half, you can start leaving them outside even at night, um, unless there's frost forecast, of course. And um, I know this is a lot of moving plants around. Some people put them on a cart or in a wagon or something like that to, you know, make the work of moving, making many trips um, in and out a little bit easier. But, you know, think about what, what you can do to maybe help you out that way. Um, and then they should be ready to be planted out. Um, and then when you're going to do that, you want to probably choose, we're going to cover this more um, in the April Garden Guru when you start planting your garden, but it would be good to choose a a day that maybe is cloudy as opposed to a bright sunny day um, and a, a day that's maybe less windy when you put them out. Um, now, if you, um, I know we lost some, oh no, we still have a lot of people. I see there's just a lot of chat questions. Um, if you don't want all this mess in your house, there's another way to do this and it's called winter sowing. And, um, you know what, you might be thinking right now, okay, I don't know if I have space to do this in the house. I got three kids and a dog. Where am I going to put this where they're not going to be walking through it or dumping it over? Um, and um, this works really good for cool season vegetables and perennials um, that are used to being out over the winter. Uh, a little bit less well for annuals, although um, I have a sister-in-law whose sister actually starts tomatoes with this method in Minneapolis. So um, I don't know if uh, it kind of goes against the way I think, but she's had success with it. It's called winter sowing. And why does it work? Um, for perennial seeds and, and cool season vegetables, um, the, the seeds are protected from sprouting, sprouting at the wrong time so that, you know, when the plant drops the seeds in the fall, the seeds don't start growing right away because it's going to be winter and then they're going to be um, killed off. So um, this perennial plant seeds have a, a method where something has to happen in order for that seed to um, start growing. Um, and what that usually is, is moisture and chilling and freezing and thawing. Um, and that happens over the course of the winter. You know, we, you know, the seeds out, lay out there in the, in the soil and it gets cold, it rains on it, it snows on it, it freezes, it thaws, you know, it rains and snows some more, freezes and thaws some more. And that breaks down the seed coat and the seeds say, oh, it's not doing that anymore. It's time to start sprouting now. 
Um, and then the other thing that um, some seeds need, and this would be a pre-treatment that I talked about earlier, is called scarification. And that's when the seed coat is so tough that it needs something especially rough in order for it to um, be able to soak up enough water to start sprouting. And that can either be like scratching the seed with some um, fine sandpaper. Um, in nature, it often happens when animals eat the seeds and it goes through a digestive system of an animal um, and that breaks down the outside of the seed coat. But anyway, um, for most plants though, just the freezing and thawing and the moisture and the chilling are enough to wake up the seed in the spring. And again, we talked about the advantages of winter sowing. Um, you don't have a lot of space inside for plants. You don't wanna deal with the mess, the lights, um, the electricity costs, uh, the time you have to spend tending the seedlings. You don't like that idea of uh, hauling them in and out to harden them off. Um, but yet you don't wanna just put seeds out there in the garden because something might eat them, they might blow away, they might wash away, they might get um, buried in, you know, with stuff way too deep for the seeds to ever sprout. So what we do is called winter sowing. And um, you can do this, like I said, with perennials that are hardy in your zone, um, self-seeding annuals, like you have, um, uh, I'm trying to think of self-seeding annuals. Um, anyway, you know, the, the, they come up by themselves, the volunteers, the next year. Native plants are really good ones. You can start this way from seed two instead of buying the, the plants. Um, and cool season vegetables. Um, some of the clues, if you want to know if a particular seed might work with this method, it might say sow early in the early spring or sow the seeds in the early autumn. Um, it might say hardy on the seed package, withstands frost. It might have the word weed, like butterfly weed, milkweed in, in its name. Or it might also have words like Siberian, Canadian, or Alpine in its name, which are clues that it comes from a very harsh, cold climate um, for at least part of the year. So what you need for this is um, a clear or translucent plastic container. And the most common ones that people use are either uh, two liter pop bottles, the clear ones, or milk cartons um, and water jugs, that kind of thing. Um, you don't want green color. So the green soda bottles are, are not, that doesn't give the plant the right uh, wavelength of light. You need duct tape, a utility knife or scissors, some seed starting mix. You need to be able to poke the holes in the bottom of the container with something, whether that's a nail or a, a utility knife or you know, some such thing, and also a method of labeling. So we start with, uh, generally the taller the container, the better, although um, in the upper right, you can see there are some not real tall containers there. Um, as long as uh, the plant has room enough to grow um, inside there, it'll work. You also want a relatively small opening on the top, which is why the jugs work really good. Um, if you have um, a, a larger opening, I'll talk about that in a minute, what you can do. No green, take the labels off and then wash and rinse and dry um, before you start. And Anna, we have a couple questions yep. about winter sorting. Um, tracking back to the stratification, is that the same as vernalization? Because she said, I grow garlic or she or he, I grow garlic and the term used for that is vernalizing. Um, it could be, I'm trying to remember what vernalizing exactly is. It could be, what it means is it has to have some kind of a situation in which the seed knows that it's now safe to, to grow. Um, boy, I'm, coming, I'm coming up with a blank as far as vernalizing what it means. I've always used the term stratification. It could be, it could be the same term. Is she referring that it has to be planted in the fall and then in order for it to come up in the spring? 
I'm not sure just to, yeah. if it was the same, but yeah, we have a couple other ones. Okay. There's one that says, it's not a question, just a shout out that this is the first year that she's winter sewing and she's super excited about it. And she thanks you for covering this bit. Oh, okay. And then um, she also asked, ask the question, does the soil type matter with winter sowing? Um, I would use the same seed starting mix that you use um, for growing inside. All right, and then I typically winter sow most of last year's seeds just to see what happens. And she says, I'm usually surprised how successful they are. Yeah, it, it's, it's surprising. Um, I'm going, oh, I don't, I don't think I mentioned that. Um, there is, if you have old seeds and you want to know if they're any good, um, put them on a wet paper towel, like 10 of them. Put 10 on a wet paper towel, put it in a, a plastic bag, seal it up, put it in a warm place. And, you know, after you see some of them germinating, count how many germinates. Um, so if you get nine out of 10, you got 90% germination rate, which means you can plant pretty much according to the directions because most of them are going to sprout. If you only get five to sprout, you only have 50% germination rate. And that means you either have, you have to sow the seeds twice as thick because only half of them are going to come up. Um, or you may want to, you know, get new seeds. If you don't get any of them to sprout, you got to throw the package of seed away. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, that just made me remind, I didn't cover that topic. If you're saving seeds, how do you know if they're any good? So any other ones? Okay, um, there, poke some holes in the bottom of the container. It's often easier to do that before you cut the container in half or make some, like in the top middle picture here, make some little slices along the edges of the milk jug that go through the top and the bottom or the side and the bottom a little bit. Then you're going to cut the jug um, off about three to four inches uh, from the bottom. And I like to leave a little hinge, a part that's uncut. And I usually leave it right under the handle of the jug because then when you pick it up, it's, it's kind of got some reinforcement there and you can pick up the jug by the handle a little bit also. Um, and so you're gonna go almost all the way around, but leave a little hinge. Um, if you don't have um, a small opening container, you can cut like a window like you see here and then put a piece of um, plastic wrap over the top of the container and then put the cover on so that, that plastic wrap is held down and you will still need to puncture a few holes in it because you don't want that much space to be open. Or the other thing is if it's a solid cover here, you can just punch some holes in it. If it's a clear cover like this, the, where the, the sun will be able to come in later. Um, so that's how you get the, the um, container ready. Then you put about three inches of your um, seed starting mix in the bottom level it off and pat it down a little bit to make sure you're getting um, the, the air bubbles out. And then you sow your seeds. Um, you don't wanna sow like a hundred in there because you will never be able to get them apart to transplant. Um, so depending on the size of the plant, you can see how they put, you know, maybe 20, 20 seeds or so in there. Um, then cover it with more um, mix in, so it's the depth that they should be planted, like a quarter inch or half inch, and then mist that well so that that top soil layer that you just put on there is thoroughly wet. And then you need to label the container. Um, I tried permanent marker one year and that, believe it or not, weathered off. And I had trouble reading what kind of plant I had inside there. Um, a paint marker, I'm trying that this year, and I'm also trying a china marker. Um, and you can either write on the jug or you can put a uh, plant label, uh, a steak or, you know, like you would label your other plants inside the jug um, so you know what's in there. Um, 
sometimes you, people use a numbering system too, like you write 11 on the jug and then you can keep a, a record on paper. Okay, number 11 is a certain kind of plant or whatever. Um, and then you seal all the way around um, with duct tape all the way around the side. Um, and then you need to set it outside in a sunny spot. <clears throat> you don't want it to be right against the house because there's gonna be too much variation of temperature there. And also um, uh, it's not gonna get the rain and snow under the eaves. Um, if you go outside on a warm day at this time of year now, <clears throat> you should see a little bit of uh, moisture on the inside of the jug. If it's not moist or if the, the soil looks dry when you look in the top, um, you might wanna mist some more through the opening in the top. Um, if you have it in a place that's kind of windy or in the open, um, group together these containers. You could put a string through all the handles or you could put it in a box or a crate of some kind to keep them from tipping over if you have heavy wind. And then just let it rain and snow on them and freeze and thaw and the sun come out and all that kind of stuff. And um, once the snow starts to melt in the spring, then you can kind of start checking for germination. And they should, do their thing at that point. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. We got a couple more little questions. Yep. Um, one is, so it's okay that the containers are white for winter sewing? They don't need to be clear? They don't need to be clear as long as you can see light through them. Okay. It's just no green. <laughs> no, no green and no completely opaque. Okay. And then are jugs open at top outside? Yes. Leave the covers off. Okay. That was the two questions we had. And then for winter sowing, are there any seeds that cannot tolerate being in the cold? Like most, like some of the most common veggies and flowers, like peppers and things. Um, like I say, I know a lady who starts tomatoes this way, they won't sprout until it gets quite warm, much warmer in the spring. Um, if you've grown tomatoes, you know that you get those volunteer tomatoes in your garden every year. So the seeds can make it through the winter, but um, they just won't be starting growing as early as if they were um, started inside. All right, that was all the questions we had for right now. Okay, then as the weather gets warmer in the spring, you've got like a little mini greenhouse really there. And so you might have to tip the top back when you get those really warmer days in the spring. But by then your plants should be hardened off so that they will um, be able to withstand that because they've been through the cold all winter. <clears throat> you may need to add um, extra water if you have a lot of days where it doesn't rain. And they may also need a little fertilizer too, just like your seedlings inside. And if you have too many of them in there and they're really thick, again, cut off some of the extra seedlings. And then um, they're just ready to put out in the garden when, it, when the soil is workable because they've already been hardened off. They've been, they've been out in the weather all the time. So um, that's pretty much it as far as um, the winter sowing. All right. And Somebody specifically asked if peppers could be grown outside, like the tomatoes. Um, yeah, I, I think so. But again, you're dealing with um, a plant that's kind of susceptible to frost. And that's the only thing I have with, with those really tender plants. Um, I'm not sure how this lady does it when she says she starts tomatoes and peppers in there, but um, I would be a, a little bit cautious of that. <clears throat> okay, and then um, one thing you can do if you have questions um, for anything for gardening, um, so when you're researching on the internet, trying to find answers, you can get some really goofy um, things coming up that are totally... Um, bogus um, and there's something that might have worked for somebody once and now they think they found a cure-all for everybody. Um, so to get really reliable information, <clears throat> um, put in uh, your, your query like seed starting 
and then put the word extension after it. And then that will bring up <clears throat> university um, research sites. Um, and they're from universities, colleges, um, research uh, stations, that sort of thing. And then you'll know that you're getting uh, really good information rather than something that could be really, um, really weird. <laughs> so any questions? There's one that says help with soil gnats problems, especially with seed starting. Um, soil mats. Gnats, like the bugs, gnats? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, it usually means you, your soil is too moist. So let the top of the soil dry out a little bit before you water again, because they like that moist soil. Um, some people I know, if you have some really fine gravel, if you have trouble with that with house plants, um, some really fine gravel or a little bit of sand over the top of the soil, um, that keeps that soil surface dry and it really discourages those um, gnats. Yeah, they're annoying. Any other questions out there? Oh, one popped up. I start tomatoes and peppers in the milk cartons. I start them about now, just set them in and out of my out of way place and let them do their thing. They start themselves when they are ready. Late May, maybe? Yeah, you leave them inside? No, I think she's talking about starting them outside. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll start when they want to. It's just that it'll probably take longer before you get tomatoes on them in the, in the summer. Yep, yeah, she just said, yep, for winter sowing. So that's, I've honestly never heard of that before. So that's kind of, I like that idea of not having the mess in my house. Yeah. <laughs> or at least you could put quite a few of them outside. You might still want to do tomatoes and peppers in the house, but it could eliminate a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. You're getting a lot of thank yous, Donna. <laughs> okay. So is there any other questions or just general garden questions too? Again, if you have, um, if you live in our area, if you have gardening questions, there's a Wood County Master Gardener website where you can ask questions. Um, and more so during the uh, growing season, we have um, uh, somebody monitoring that site at least once a week, sometimes more often. Um, that might be a, another place for to get answers for questions. Yeah. There, there is another question of what can't be winter sown. Um, I would say those really tender uh, vegetables like tomatoes and eggplants, um, peppers, um, the, the ones that, you know, are the first ones to freeze and the last ones you want to set out in the spring because you don't want them to be too cool when you put them out there. Um, you would have best luck with other ones than those. And then somebody asked if you have an Instagram account. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Could you winter sow carrots? Yeah, you probably could, but carrots are best sown directly in the ground because you want that root to be straight and going straight down. Otherwise, you're going to get those really weird corkscrew, curvy carrots. So um, I would say those are best to be the seeds planted right in the soil in your garden. Oh, and somebody said that they use old plastic blinds as labels and she cuts yes. them to the seeds the size she needs and larger for putting in soil outside. 
Yep, I know a lot of people that use that if you have them. It's a really good way to use them. <laughs> what else are you going to do with them? Yep. And somebody had asked if we could do a program about tomato blight, but we already did that one. <laughs> yeah, we so did that I one. Shared, so if anybody else saw that in the chat, I actually shared the YouTube link to that tomato program. It was called Success with Tomatoes. Um, and it was an amazing, really super informative, like all the problems that you could have for tomatoes and any hints and tips to be successful tomato growing. So that's in the chat too. If um, you saw, I think it was Dan that commented that, that um, you can check that out too. Yeah, I usually do this one on seed starting every year because people, you know, are curious about it. And I usually do the May program about planting your garden every year because, uh, you know, people, when they want to get close to the planting time, they, you know, they want to know that information. So those I usually have every year, but um, try to do something else all the other months, so. All right, was there any other questions or comments tonight? I don't know, Donna, I think, I think you gave them enough information to have it all ready to go. It was very informative. They're probably, heads are probably spinning. <laughs> yep. um, next month, we're going to be talking about adding more <clears throat> native plants to your landscape because we hear about so many species that are going extinct and the lack of pollinators we have and all that. So we're going to be talking about that next month and what you can do, just little things that will even help out in the long run for a lot of plants and animals and birds and insects out there. So, yeah, And it's always best to go native if you can, because then you know it'll be successful because it was here to begin with. Right. So. All right. Let's see. Um. I think that's it. If there's no more questions or comments, um, the only other comment that came in in the chat was that she invited. Um, there's a winter sewing zone for Facebook group. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah. So. <clears throat> So yeah, so um, otherwise, yeah, next month, join every month we, we host a gardening guru program. Um, and like Donna said, next month is on native plants. Um, you can view this later on um, after it reloads up tonight on our YouTube channel. And we have, like I said, there are 16 other programs that we have specifically on our garden guru um, on our YouTube channel now. And every month there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see oh there is another question i just saw do you know much about grapes she said i have one that was light colored grape but it looks like it grew in like a concord is it possible it was a graft and that it was on concord rootstock um if it was a graft even if the rootstock was concord, unless the graft died and the rootstock is growing from that rootstock, then it might revert to whatever the rootstock is. Um, if the original graft is still on there, it should not um, revert to the rootstock as long as the original graft is there. Um, and it could be too that you know, somewhere along the line, something got mislabeled. Yeah, I've had that before where I was supposed to have cherry tomatoes and I had big beef steak tomatoes instead. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few seeds that have come up that are not what was in the package. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, 
All right, if that's it for any more questions, we'll sign off for the night. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, Donna, it's a great program, very informative and very helpful. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep, bye-bye everybody. Bye.